go episode seven part seven of dick cantino's story my father's story this is accordion brat my name is pete cantino um yeah so this is the last episode here i'm gonna be back next week or the week after i'm gonna bring my um really close friend of the family corky brumble my my father's friend my friend man we started working together when i was 17 18 years old here in vegas and he's just been with with us play he played with my dad for years as a conductor, um, keyboardist, great, man. So anyway, this is the um, the last episode. It ends, well, this introduces my mother, man. This is when she comes on into the scene and, and all the, man, what a, what a story, man. I don't know. Again, it's my father and my mother, so uh, I apologize if I'm being too, you know, me, me, me. But <laughs> anyway, um yeah, so this in this episode he comes back from Korea and you know how how the you know the showbiz kind of took him back and uh, how that went. Interesting, man. And also as I said my mother comes into the picture. My mother was Lee Snowden. Um if you don't know that name, please google her name and uh she was an actress Universal Studios um got her start on the Jack Benny show. Man, she's got a story of her own and God, I she passed away when I was 19. This was back in 1982. And man, just just a beautiful, beautiful person, woman, mother, everything, man. So it's it's I'm listening to this, my father talking about it, and I'm crying. So that's it, man. Here this is the um this is the the final episode of this of my father's story. Um quick note, you know, because I'm listening to this and I heard this I put a song in here, um, She's Funny That Way, and my father was playing a court of ox. And it's funny because the story I heard was that he was playing a court of ox and Joe senior, Joe Patoza senior came in to see him. Maybe my father was playing around Seattle and um, I don't know if they knew each other from before or he introduced himself, but he went up to my father and said, I don't really see you playing a court of ox. If you ever decide to go back to acoustic, please give me a call. And um, this isn't a plug, man. This is I. That's all I know. I would have people come up to me. If, what, if I'm, I play a Potosa. That's all I've played, and I'm not, you know, not near the caliber as my father. But people would ask me, "Did your father always play a Cordovax?" I mean, I'm sorry, play a Potosa. I know. He, I think he played an Excelsior once, and he played other ones. Um, but growing up, man, it was Potosa and I love them. They're like family. I think it's a fantastic accordion. I'm not trying to knock any other accordion because I don't know. I, and I've never ventured out. I just, I just love, I love the, the instrument that they make and I, and I, and I love them as a people. So anyway, that's just a little side note I thought I'd throw in there, but here we go, man. Here's the, um, the final episode of my father again i think i mentioned this before it it goes you know of course my father's story went on and on up until he passed away at the age of 87 but um he this is the meat of it man this is you know from you know from the horace height days up through you know with the army and meeting my mother and da 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 so all right well i hope you enjoyed and i thank you for uh if you got this far and i thank you for sticking around and yeah so as i said we'll be back next week with something <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. So, uh, I got on the ship. Same ship, by the way, USS Gordon. Turned out that way. Only 16 months later. And, uh, wow, heading home, you know. 
Unbeknownst to me, I guess the press, now that I'd gotten out, they were, you know, they, they, they are who they are, what they are, and for whatever that's worth. They knew I was coming home, so. But when we docked at San Francisco, and uh, I heard on the loudspeaker they wanted Sergeant Richard Cantino to report on. By the way, start thinking somebody, something, maybe something happened to a member of my family, and they want me to get off first. I did. I never had that ego thing going. Where, yeah, man, you know, they want me because there must be the, the you know, the newspapers there. I didn't think of that. I, well, I got to the front of the line there, and all of a sudden I saw all these photographers, and uh, I saw my mom and dad. They were crying. So I come walking down the gangplank there with cameras flashing and things. In fact, I've got that picture on top of the counter there by the table. You know, outstretched arms and things. And, well, they, like me, me with my children, they, they love me very much. And I can imagine how frightened they must have been the whole time I was gone, not knowing what, if something might have happened. You know, like uh, one time when for some reason, you know, uh, my mother, she wrote me every day, every day, and I'd write her every day. It nothing else, just a, nothing else, just a, even a note to let her know that I was okay. Well, for some reason, and my grandmother was living with her at the time, her mother, and for some reason, for about a week or ten days, she didn't get a letter from me. But now, you know, and of late, I can imagine the torment. The, 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 how fearful she must have become. They, she kept saying, something must have happened, something happened, you know, and uh, she'd wait every day, get up early in the morning, wait for the mailman. No letter, no letter. One day, my grandmother happened to see the mailman coming first, and all of a sudden she started yelling, according to my mother, Mary, Mary, lots of letters, lots of letters, you know. They had all accumulated well. She had a great big cry like I would, like, you know. One thing about those two people all the way, eh? They were terrific, terrific parents. Very responsible, very loving. Anyway, I come down to, you know, the gang right there, and we embrace and stuff. And this was now the first part of 54. And uh, so I guess, uh, oh, uh, even when I went to, you know, to be uh, discharged, a little anecdote here, uh, they're waiting for me. I had to go, you know, report, get my last medical and to be discharged. And a uh, cute little story here because, uh, you know, I went... I'm in line there, and they're checking you out. It's supposed to be like a routine check. Check your blood pressure and things like that and before they give you your final papers, and you're honorably discharged. Well, I thought it was a routine thing, and I had my blood pressure taken. Nothing to it, I thought. And this, uh, whoever he was, corporal, sergeant, the medic, he says, so would you mind go sitting over there for a while, relaxing? And I says, why? He says, well, you've got, your blood pressure's a little high. And I said, well, what does that mean? He says, well, if it doesn't, uh, he says, if it doesn't come down, uh, we can't discharge you until we probably have to hospitalize you, you know, for a day or two. And so I was cool. I stayed cool. And, uh. And I went and sat down on the bench for a while. Well, sitting next to this guy next to me, I, I uh, kind of leaned over. I says, hey, um, how's your blood pressure? He says, fine. I says, uh, could you do me a favor? I says, please, just listen to me. I said, would you, uh, he had a pencil, a pen. You don't know how to pen, a, a lead pencil. I says, do me a favor, please. I says, break off the eraser on that pencil and a piece of that lead. I said, please do it for me. I'll pay you, whatever you need. And he said, no, that's all right. So he did that. He broke the uh, eraser, and he broke off a piece of lead. 
and uh, tried to be cool, which I was, and I erased, you know, it was done in pencil, so I erased the numbers they put on as my blood pressure, and I asked him, I says, uh, what are your numbers? And he gave me his numbers. I wrote his blood pressure numbers on my paper before I went, you know, through the, the line there. See, what happened was when a medic uh, makes, uh, you know, uh, fills out the, the sheet on your medical uh, status, you just take that and you you kind of report to, uh, you know, you get in line and you go through uh, the officer there and he checks it over. And, of course, what he was trying to tell me was that he was telling me to anticipate this officer sending me to the hospital if he saw those numbers, unless after sitting down, uh, you know, uh, he could show different numbers. So they were so busy there, there were so many guys, I didn't bother going back and showing that medic the numbers because he, he knew he didn't put them there. I just made out that he put down those numbers and I was waiting in line just to go to the uh, commanding officer to leave. And it worked. He checked it over, hit the stamp, boom, I was out the door, I ran. I ran to the car. You know, my folks were waiting. I said, let's get out of here. I'll explain later. So then, you know, we we drove, however, and all the way back to Glendale, 1560. Beautiful home. Planning on resuming the career and setting the world on fire. Somehow. Fun. It was exciting. My sister Josephine there, my brothers Victor and Pete, all the friends in Glendale coming over. The newspapers were there. Woo! Glorious time, glorious time. Yeah, yeah, and it'll last forever. So, uh, but it was, it was glorious. It was, it was happy, it was real, it was family. You know? It was uh, the first part of 54. I was now out of the Army. The strange thing, uh, initially, if there was any resentment about the draft dodging thing, um, it was overshadowed. It was uh, maybe a misinterpretation on my part, too, in that I, uh, because of the attendance, the tremendous surge of bookings, yeah, well, that's it. They, I did my time, and everything's like it was. I think what really happened was most of the people, as opposed to let's resume this interest and this love and things, they were curiosity seekers. They, as I look back, you know, because of the of the thing, the events that happened shortly after that. Wherever I played, there'd be packed houses, and uh, and heavy, heavy interest. You know, you know, I gotta, I gotta mention this. It's always uh, made me wonder, you know, about these phobias and things. Because, look, my my mom and dad, they worship me. And I worship them. Uh, the reason I mention it is because while I was in Korea, look, look at this. While I was at McNeil Island, um... I felt like king shit. I mean, there was nothing bothering me. No phobias about this or that. About uh, just like totally in control of my emotions and and mental state, whatever. You know, just yet when I got back to my environment, it was like it represented something. I don't know consciously. Uh, the phobias would come out as soon as I got out of McNeil Island. I thought that's what all I needed. I mean, I was grateful to do the incarceration. Yeah, that would make me inwardly a happy, peaceful person. Wow. I would have stayed in McNeil Island for another six months if I could have the total assurance. Strange thing, got back into the environment. 
mom and dad, family, or what, it represented something. Interesting, because uh, phobias just came back on as if I had never been to McNeil Island, where I felt like I was in you know, total control of my mind, my emotions, and no phobias, fears. I don't understand it, but... The reason I mention it is because while I was in Korea, you know, hero, leader, staff sergeant, no fears, phobias, anxieties, none. I bet you it was a matter of a couple of weeks after I got home and discharged. Oh, what's this phobia? What's, what's that? What, this fear? This What I used to be afraid of? Being alone? Being away from my family? I was just in Korea. 16 months. How could I be a... How can I be afraid? Was it because I was... They represented being too sheltered? That it represented something? It triggered... I don't know. But that's... That's the actual fact. Phobia seemed to But nevertheless, you know, I even I, I would revert to my old system, see, like, okay, I don't want to be alone, make sure somebody's with me. Uh, I don't want to be on any higher than the fourth floor, so what? I'll just get a room on the second or third floor. Now I guess because everybody was always around me, I didn't want to analyze or be, you know. I let it slide. It's quite a glorious year, 1954. Uh, that way, uh, I traveled, you know, with my family, especially my dad. If my mom couldn't make it because of my brothers and sister and things at home. I was back at 1560 Virginia. No army beef that was behind me now. At least that's where I lived and thought. Working all these clubs. And, well, I'll tell you what. I never... I, I, I never got upset about being without a companion or being dating different girls when I was in Korea because... Before the Army thing, I had way more than my share. And I knew that I could anticipate all kinds of pussy. You know, and that's exactly what happened. 1954, I was all over the place. I dated everybody, you know. Sex, no sex. It's a difference. Next case, you know, as nicely as I could. Well, I shouldn't do this. Well, okay, uh, nice meeting you, sweetheart. Uh, next case, let's go. Let's, I was dating everybody. I, I came to know uh, a woman by the name of Ray Lynn, R-A-E-L-Y-N-N. She was West Coast editor of Movie Stars Parade magazine. Man, I was dating, <laughs> I was dating some of the most delicious people, man. These girls were... I'd flip through the pages of the magazine. I'd say, I'd call her up. She liked me a lot, you know. I never slept with her. Just a middle-aged woman at the time. She was old, you know, seemed that way. But she wasn't that attractive. But she was a real nice person, and she liked me. Ray, what about this girl? You know. So uh, she'd set it up. Some of the dates would be nothing but political. By that time, she had, even though I had the army beat, I was very noteworthy. And if the girls didn't know it, uh, they weren't that aware. Their agents or managers would know. So wherever I went, you know, it was Harrison Carroll at the time, uh, uh, Luella Parsons, Hedda Hopper. They all loved me. They, they really did. They really loved me so that, you know, if I would, at that time with the Sunset Strip, they had the Macambo, they had the Crescendo next to it. They had cereals across the street. Uh, they had the uh, the Ambassador Hotel downtown Los Angeles with its coconut grove. Played there, you know. 
even though I had the beef, uh, initially, like I say, the demand was high. Interest was high. Curiosity seekers, I guess, or whatever, but that was 1954, leading into 55. It was as if nothing had happened, and it just kept going. So I was dating everybody. Ray, what about this girl, you know? Like I said, I dated Piper Laurie, Ann Blythe, Colleen Townsend, uh, uh, Terry Moore. I had a couple of girls I got next to who were Howard Hughes in the Howard Hughes stable. He put them up in their own home, beautiful homes, in like uh, near Beverly Hills. And I'd go on trekking on over, boy, and do my thing and leave, you know. No ties that way. But, uh, started dating Piper again, but still didn't feel the urge to want to make a move on her. Just a nice person. Beautiful girl. You know, at that time she was, what, uh, 21, 22 years old. And, uh, a lot of the others, you know, and, and mostly girls who weren't starless. They weren't stars that way, but they were very pretty. You know, brought out the Hollywood with the promise. So I guess to some of them, uh, dating, uh, dating a person like me, uh, well, I was a good-looking guy and stuff, but it's, it is that maybe uh, to a lot of them it was like, if, it, if anybody didn't quite think so, it was a good move uh, career-wise. Because no matter where I went, I'd go to... The, Macambo or Sears or any place. Harrison Carroll, he'd be, normally he'd be there himself. Luella and Hedda, they had their uh, writers, people representing them. And they would report who was seen with whom, you know. And that time, so no matter what, they'd always write Dick Cantino was seen with and so forth. And so, quite a, quite a thing. And this went on. And So uh, now we're into about the first part of, of 55. I had come to know a lot of people, you know, uh, in the movies, the entertainment. They knew of me, I knew of them. It was it was a it was a lottery ticket. It was it was a jackpot. It was the lines crossing. It was an idea whose time had come. It was. A very uh, uh, exciting thing, you know. And uh, anyway, I'd gotten a, a telegram. At that time, Tony Curtis was married to uh, Janet Lee, And they were going to throw a party for uh, uh, Rory Calhoun. He had done, uh, he was very big back then, and he had done a thing. He had done a thing on, on uh, Lux, not Lux Video, Playhouse 90. A lot of those actors back then, they were uh, they were afraid to do uh, live, uh, you know, live acting things because making a movie, you do one or two lines at a time. And back then, it wasn't like now. Even with your specials on TV, the uh, it was done live. The whole script had to be memorized, blocked camera in the middle, sets all around in a circle, or whatever, but it was done that way, and a lot were fighting, Calhoun, yeah, Calhoun was one of them, but he never let got around to doing it, they were going to throw a big party for him, they liked the guy, he was hot stuff back then, Tony and Janet were having a party for Rory, appreciate your showing up, you know, blah, 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 so I thought, I was supposed to date this one blonde bombshell, she was a she was the, if she wasn't an nymphomaniac, she was the closest thing to it. But she was, you know, very exciting and stuff. But there wasn't anything any attraction there. I mean, as far as anything serious, I just, you know, something to to be next to, to enjoy sexually, you know. But anyway, I called, so I called up Ray and I said, do you know anybody that, uh, like somebody that's really nice, somebody... Because, you know, until then I just call and, and I say, how about this girl, that girl, who's, who's in town now? I never, I never got turned down. I, I mean, 
Any girl I wanted to date, I look at her picture, I would date her because, like I say, and Ray didn't have to call her to say, would you want to date Dick and Tino? Because all Ray would say was, look, because see, what would she do? Sometimes Ray would set up with what they would call a publicity date. You'd have the camera guy going, they'd take sure you're getting out of a car because you're going to go to the ambassador, you're going to go to the zeros or what. And you went to this restaurant. And, you know, it could have been just a publicity thing. And after the, uh, the publicity shoot, you say goodnight, let's name it that to you. And so with that as a shield, I was able to uh, date anybody. Most of the time, we find each other interesting, at least for the moment. You know, a little sack time, a little back of the car time, or whatever time would might be involved. Hey, show time, you know. So she says, well, as a matter of fact, she says, there's a girl that just got in town, and uh, she was on the Jack Benny show. And all she did was walk across the stage, and she stopped the show cold. And, uh, you know, not because of any particular attributes, she just stopped the show cold. Very lovely girl. And I says, great, give me her phone number. Well, for the first time, Ray said, uh, I, I don't know whether she wants to date you. I better find out first. And if she does, I'll give you her phone number. I says, okay, I kind of pass it off that way. And, All right. Well, she called me back shortly, that, that day or the next day, whatever. And she says, yeah, her name is Lee Snowden. And uh, she would like to date you. She'd like to go with you. I says, great. So I called her up. I was, I went to the Alex Theater to see a movie that night with Charlie Guadiano, you know, one of the Kumbadis, Joe Trevally, those guys. So I, we were watching, I think it was Battleground or Battle Cry, Cap Hunter, you know. So I went to the payphone at the Alex Theater in Glendale. And I called her up. And we talked. I, I, I spotted the southern accent. I didn't know what she looked like at all. I didn't know that she she knew. Uh, I don't think she, wait a minute. I don't know, she had seen my, well, let's know the story. But we talked and she said, She's looking forward to it. This is great, you know. Anyway, the big night comes and she tells me, she says, on Hayworth, on Hayworth, right off of Sunset. Because there were the couple of her girlfriends. Uh, gosh, I got a picture of their face. I know. There's Barbara Stewart and uh, forget the other woman's name who she died shortly after that, this other woman, but uh, she was there with her. You know, she was there to kind of pursue some sort of a career with the movies. But she says, that's who she was rooming with. I said, okay. And I took, took my drive over there. And I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. She gave me the right address, but it's one of those things where Odd numbers on one side, even on the other, I was going by, but for some reason I didn't sign it, find it, so I thought, I kept driving up and down, I don't see those numbers. So, I thought, well, I don't know what she looks like anyway, I'll just go home. So, I started heading back home to Glendale. I guess I was about two or three blocks away. I said, let me look on the other side of the street. No, let me go back again. Some motivated me to go back again. Sure enough, I saw the numbers on the other side. And uh, parked the car, walked up the walkway, it was sort of set back. I rang the doorbell and heard a voice upstairs, uh, like talking through the second, store, second floor window. There's two, two stories. Um, the door's open. Come on in. I'll be right down. So I went in. I thought, what does she look like? I'm not trying to dramatize something here. This is the truth. I thought, what does she look like? I suppose I don't like what I see. I've got a blind date here. I have no idea what she looks like. Not that I was so wrapped up in myself. I just didn't, you know, I didn't know what she looked like. So, 
locked in. They're kind of standing around, sitting, standing, waiting. I, right away, I started looking at the, on the whatever was downstairs. See if I could see a picture that said Lee Snowden, you know. And uh, maybe open up a drawer, look in, you know, and close that drawer, look in. I thought, if I don't like what I see, I'm just going to sneak out the door. It was that kind of a thing, you know. I couldn't find a picture. Prior to that time, I got to say that I was dating so many girls. I was having such a picnic that when people would say, when you're getting married, my favorite answer was, I'm waiting for the Pope. I don't know whether that was an original or I was quoting somebody, but it sure seemed to fit. I'm waiting for the Pope. It, it wasn't because I had so many girls I was dating. It's like, I think I was so wrapped up in family as well that I didn't want to violate that place either. You know, of, of total security with family, dating all the girls I want anyway. I thought, what really happens when somebody, you know, supposedly where you get married, somebody knocks you off your feet? What happens? It could never happen to me. I was having too much fun. And there was no way I was going to leave my family. That's kind of the attitude. Well, I waited and I guess I could hear her coming toward the, the stairs there. You know, I'm standing back, standing up. And uh, she goes walking down the stairs like only she could walk. At first, because uh, of the, the ceiling type of thing over the stairs, all I could see was her shoes and ankles, calf. She's wearing a, a black wraparound type dress. About 112 pounds. Her ankles, knees, the dress, the shape of her body. Her bust line as she came walking down the stairs it was like my mind was taking it in in slow motion. And then I saw her face. Um, it seemed as though all I could do was stare at her. Talk with her, but... And we, we went to the party, and I, I felt something I'd never felt. It's like there were people at the party, Tony and Janet, Rory and everybody else, but I, I didn't care. Um, it was like an, 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 like an imaginary thing all around me. At one point, this, this writer, James Bacon, at the time, he was with UP, one of those eight, United Associated Press, United Press, he just walked over, <laughs> kind of put his, his hand on her shoulder, just momentarily. Well, hi, Lee, how are you doing? Because she was quite a sensation, you know. Uh, was what she had done just by walking across the stage and all the studios were clamoring for her. You know, and she ended up with Universal, Universal Pictures on an agent's advice. MGM wanted her, they all wanted her. But Jim put his hand on her shoulder and, how you doing? As soon as he walked away, I says, what do you do that for? He says, do what? Why do you have to put his hand on your shoulder? She says, well, why not? There's nothing wrong with that. I don't want him to put his hand on your shoulder anymore. It was that kind of a thing. I mean, what are you, what's, what's wrong with you? You know, is that... So we, we, we started getting into this, a little argument about that. But that quieted down. 
Uh, we ended up going to, but after that, I didn't want to say goodnight. Uh, but we went to, uh, at that time, a, a very notable personality was Larry Finley. Larry Finley, you know, Hollywood there, he had his show, and he had a radio show, see. Uh, television was still very brand new at that time, so radio was the thing. Larry Finley was one of the personalities. So he had it right next door to Macombo on the Sunset Strip. There was a Larry Finley's restaurant. You know, everybody go there, see. they go there for a late breakfast, and he'd, he'd be doing a, a radio, live radio interview, you know, calling up different personalities, actors, stars, you know, to, to interview, you know, while they were there. And they knew that to the agents or whatever. See, anyway, we decided we'd go there, and, and you know, and I don't know if he called me up at, uh, that night or not, but I didn't care. He just meant staying with her longer that night. <laughs> at one point we're sitting there and I'm just staring at her you know we might have gotten into another argument for some other ridiculous thing she says you know here I think you're a terrific person she says but sometimes I think you could you could be a bastard and I said what'd you say that for you know now another argument you see well I knew that something was happening that never happened before. Something was happening, and it was very foreign to me. I had to see her again as soon as I could. And she, she, she thought so too. That's when uh, she told me something very bizarre. At that time, because I was such hot stuff, you know, outside of the Reeds, I think it was Harry Reed or Henry Reed or Bill, I don't know, Bill Reed Studios on Sunset Boulevard to advertise that, you know, his clients were important or whatever. It was a photography place. He had my picture about as big as a billboard on the front lawn of his property there, of his office. And uh, Lee told me a short time after that that you know, one time she drove by uh, with Barbara Stewart and she didn't know who I was. She didn't know I was even the same guy that called her and asked her for that date to go to uh, see uh, Rory Calhoun. She looked over at the picture while they were driving by, and she told Barbara, someday I'm going to marry that guy. That reminds me of an interesting story, too. One time, years ago, when my mother uh, went to, you know, like a fortune teller thing, you know, astrology, fortune telling, what she... Just wanted to try to figure out if they can predict anything this way or that way. Wanted to know about what would be involved, I guess, with me and my career. Or whatever, her life, the fam rest of the family, whatever. Uh, I remember she told me back then, before, before I even uh, met Lee, she says that this uh, fortune teller told her that I was going to marry a blonde. A very beautiful blonde. And I just remember that part of it. And uh, I mention that for a reason, because years later, after I'm married to Lee, we're sitting around talking, and I said, at one point I happened to say, Mom, remember you went to a fortune teller once, and uh, she told you that I was gonna, the girl I married was going to be a blonde, a beautiful blonde. She says, yeah, well, she wasn't too uh, correct. She wasn't too right about that because she said uh, that girl's name was Martha. I says, well, that's, that's, that's Lee's real name. That's Lee's legal name. It's not Lee. It's Martha. It's Martha Lee. 
Well, you could have knocked my mom over with a feather with that. Could have knocked me over, could have knocked any of us over. Anyway, she did tell Barbara that. You know. <clears throat> she was going to marry this guy. We started dating. God, I, I loved her so much. Everything about her. Um, in the beginning, when uh, when my my folks didn't know how serious I might be, and they didn't know she had two kids, they didn't know she was they didn't know she was a divorcee. It's strange, but <laughs> my dad took to her right away. I mean, she just charmed him, and he just charmed her. It was great. Uh, my mom was the one that resisted. You know, it's like even even though she had said hello to her a couple of times, it was like her opinion wasn't too high for some reason. She wasn't like, hey, well, nice girl, yeah. You know. The father loves her too. She's terrific, you know. So I said, Mom, let's have dinner, just the three of us. You and, and, and me and Lee. And we were going to go down to this, one of these Italian restaurants there in Hollywood. So I set it up. I thought, this has got to do it. This has got to do it. Once she meets Lee, Lee meets her, and ready to sit down and talk. Wow, strange thing happened. It was action and reaction type of thing on the strain side, the negative side. I could feel the walls come up, the, the, the sense of a battle a line being drawn. I don't know what was said, how it was said. I just knew that I loved my mother one way. I loved Lee as my girlfriend. I, person I'd probably want to, at that time, probably, I used the word probably, but somebody I wanted, I thought I would want to marry. I love them both. They must love each other. How can that, how can that, how can that fail? It was the first time for me that way. Somehow, I guess, there's something about Lee that she wouldn't embrace for whatever reasons, maybe because of the typical Italian thing, the, the mother, you know, was gonna was jealous for whatever reasons. And the wife who or the girlfriend that senses this and with the law of self preservation wants to stand up to. The walls came up and I what a strange experience. I knew that after we left, that Lee wasn't going to say, what a terrific lady. And she wasn't going to say, you know, I've come to meet her now. She's a hell of a girl. Somehow, you know, a word got to my, my you know, my dad that she's got two kids anyway, she's a divorcee. I don't know whether my mom swayed him, swayed him or not. But all of a sudden he started alienating himself that way. I think all of that coupled with the realization that in fact I was serious about her. They didn't see me, they didn't see me bump and run with her. No, no, she wasn't just another girl. So then began the campaign to try to undermine the relationship. Even having, maybe even my, my friends in Glendale. He says, the divorcee, what are you doing? You got the kids. I don't know where the ideas were born and the, the flack was coming from.
You can have any, any girl you want. What are you doing? Are there worse with two kids? Go to Italy. Yeah, find a virgin. <laughs> Fuck. I think I, I, there were times when I, three or four times, I'd go without calling her. Like for the sake of family and peace, peace of mind. I, I just try to break away. I was getting sick over it. I, I couldn't even perform. The the uh, NBC was for a while. They were pretty hot to trot. They were pretty hot to trot. You know, with wanted to get me a show uh, with the NBC affiliate out of Channel Four in Los Angeles. With the ambition of maybe, in spite of the Army thing, I'd, I'd have my own network show. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't think. I was, Gloria, with this, this girl that sang on the show, Gloria, whatever her name was. Um, all of a sudden, I started getting a phobia about, like, I, I, I might be performing. It was live, you know, that I, that I might pass out while I was performing. I didn't even concentrate on what I was playing, what I was saying. The whole endeavor was how do I just get through this? And not how well I do, but how do I get through it without passing out? I try to go without seeing her. I'm driving down the street, maybe see her car. Her blonde hair was long at that time, down to her shoulders. So I'd maybe call her, or have to see her again. God, I, I'd hold her in my arms. And it was like something you never wanted to let go forever. It was such a great sense of security. It was something I never dreamed you could experience. I always thought it was just whatever security you would feel with family. Time would go by and I'd see her. On, if I had to, I'd see her on the sneak. Uh, you still see it one time. My, my dad wouldn't talk to me for a month at a time. My mom, she'd be crying every night because I was going to drive to Hollywood to see Lee. Try to break off again. Try to break off again. God damn it! I'm just reliving. I'm okay now. I'm just reliving. <sighs> they were so dead set against that. I don't know. Later on, I guess I talked it over with, with Lee or whomever. They said, well, you know, this was your dad's opportunity to travel. Maybe because he felt so uh, trapped himself. And gave me, he loved to meet people and travel and the chance to travel with you, the same, to be with people. And uh, maybe offer them a sense of security too because the money you were making in the home, you bought the home and they never had to worry. It was part of, you know, part of the dream I had in my youth. I was going to, yeah, before I even met Horace, I, I, the promise was I was going to build a home for them on the ocean. Vicino Mari. Mom, Dad, I'm going to get you a home vicino mare, close to the sea. The dream. Before I met Lee, I had bought these two pieces of property in Glendale, overlooking where Gloria uh, uh, Ludwig used to live, near there, overlooking uh, Burbank, Glendale, Hollywood. Two pieces of property, right next to each other. Have a home built. For them, another home for me.
when I met her, the two pieces of property weren't that important. They were, but unless she could be figured in on the plan. So I found myself having to choose. I couldn't have my cake and eat it too. I had to choose. Madly in love with Lee, loving my family as I did, I had to choose. So one day when I'm in St. Louis, I, I knew I just could even discuss things like this. I knew I, I loved her so much. I, I call up Joe Glazer, you know. And I said, uh, Mr. Glazer, I met this girl and I want to buy her an engagement ring. And she's like, look at this, it's the money I'm making. But I, I, I couldn't find myself, you know, I was never that type to say, hey, Give me a couple thousand. I want to buy you Leah Ring. You know, so I was never that nature. I says I need uh, I need a couple thousand dollars. This ring I sell. He says you got it. You know you got it, kid. Be there tomorrow morning. So however he said it was there in the morning. I think it was about twenty five hundred. I went down and I bought this ring. I didn't know anything about diamonds. You know, whether they, they're alive or old or sort of yellow. And I thought size counted, baby. Not this huge diamond. <laughs> and I go home, I'm going to propose to her. I got to do it. I got to do it because it's killing me. I went down to 155 pounds. Couldn't play, couldn't think. I dreaded so much this conflict. I dreaded it so much, this conflict. Why couldn't it just be like a, a, a big happy thing? The girl you love, that was my dream. The girl you love, the family you love. Everybody's together. Everybody loves everybody. Pass the time. Here's the girl I love. Here's the family I love. And they love each other. And the world's beautiful. God damn conflict. Why? Why? Why couldn't they have said, this is the girl you love? We love her too. And even maybe motivating her to say, this is your family, I love them, they love me, we love you, we love each other. Hey, what's it all about? I uh, picked her up one day and shortly after I got back on the trip with the ring. And uh, I was very nervous. We drove to the parking lot of the Incarnation Church near the corner of Glen Oaks and uh, and I think it's since it was either Glen Oaks and either Central or Glendale Boulevard, you know. And I, I parked and I, I waited a while. She kept wondering. I reached into my pocket, opened up the ring box. Now she started crying. I start crying.
So there's no right way and wrong way. There's the way you are, the way somebody is, mother, father, brother, sister, friend, husband, wife, children. And you're either of, of a level of consciousness that's related, or you're not. And there is no condemnation. There is really no criticism. There is none of that. Why they have divorces? Why they have uh, children who leave their parents? Parents who leave their children. People getting divorces. People. The beauty is the realization that nobody's to blame. Nobody's to blame. It's this fucking thing in the ether. The same force, similar to television pictures and sounds that a set can pick up using the same plug as a light bulb to prove these pictures and things are in the air that make us act like squirrels in a cage a cork on the ocean sound pretty philosophical poetic yeah yeah it does but it's still the fucking truth Thank <laughs> you. 